Thank you all for coming today. Uh, we are delighted to have Rich Rockwell mm -hmm. here with us um, from the Norman Rockwell Museum. He's the Director of Digital Learning and Engagement. And in that role, he's responsible for producing experiences and content that engage people with the uh, Rockwell exhibition and collection, and also the field of illustration arts. His primary focus has been creating partnerships with educational institutions to create immersive experiences um, and to make it more accessible. Um, he's turned a very small museum in Western Mass into this cutting edge uh, a We're museum, <laughs> an example model of immersive media. So today we're going to hear that story about how he did that. Well, thank, so, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Um, you know, when, when someone asks me to talk at MIT, I'm not quite sure what I should cover So because I, I don't know how much you all know. So um, I thought first I would just sort of cover a few things. Uh, and if this is all stuff that you already know, uh, well, then we'll just skip over it. But I wanted to get a sense of what the Norman Rockwell Museum is. Um, we basically have sort of three facets to our mission. One, we hold the largest collection of Norman Rockwell artwork uh, in the world. Um, but also, and we focus on, on and sort of bringing out and, and bringing awareness to Norman Rockwell and his work. But we also have, in the last 11 years, moved to uh, expand our mission to include the field of illustration art. Uh, and during that time, um, the museum itself has basically just mushroomed in terms of what we do and what, how we engage with people. Um, the, there's a third facet to our, our mission, and that's um, looking at how um, illustration, and specifically the work of our, uh, Norman Rockwell, um, can be used to do things to inspire people to do good things uh, and to be more civically minded. Uh, so this is Massachusetts, for those of you who don't know, and uh, we are right over there on the other side of the state. We're two towns from the New York state line. And just to give a sense, we're about two to three hours between Boston and between Boston and New York. And so for people to be aware of Norman, people know who Norman Rockwell is, but um, they have to get there and they pretty much have to make the decision to, to go there. So we've become effectively a destination venue. Um, and so people need to make a trip of it. Um, when you go into our museum, you'll see all 323 Saturday evening post covers and you'll see uh, basically the full scope of Rockwell's work. Um, when you look at this work, what is the first thing you think of? Anybody? Post, post World War II. Anything else? It's pretty pretty white bread, right? <laughs> right. So that's one of the challenges that we face is that uh, it depicts uh, middle class America in the middle twentieth century, and we have to sort of figure out. How can we create relevance and context to a broader contemporary audience? Um, Norman Rockwell also went on, uh, after he left the Saturday Evening Post in the early 1960s, he went to work for the magazine, and he started to work on more socially, um, I would say, relevant uh, images uh, depicting sort of what was going on in our country. So this is also Norman Rockwell. Uh, as I mentioned, in 2008, we moved on to include uh, illustration art. Uh, and so this covers a wide gamut of, of, of work uh, from cartoon illustrations from The New Yorker to uh, artwork that would have appeared in Sports Illustrated to uh, other works that happens to be, hap uh, to be in newspapers and periodicals. Um, but one of the questions people always ask is, what is illustration? Why isn't it not fine art? And when you look at these three paintings, what differentiates these three paintings? What differentiate, il differentiates illustration from fine art? Uh, and, and the question, and the answer is, is that illustration is used to support other media and to create, and it's intended to be used in a mass-produced way. Okay, so unlike the fine art like Picasso and, Da Vinci and all those folks who had people who sponsored them and they made these paintings 
illustration is used to be mass produced. It comes in all different sizes, and what we, we try to convey is that illustration is a mirror that reflects, creates, and reinforces our cultural societal stereotypes and norms for any given time and place. Uh, and it comes in all shapes and sizes. So the things that I was asked to answer, these questions were, were asked of me about four years ago. Um, and what's basically, what is an innovative way to build awareness of our mission and the collection, how to build universal access for a venue that's is pretty much a place where people have to go to to see it. Uh, how can we best connect these cultural and society, societal touch points uh, that are illustrated and exemplified by illustration? Uh, and how can we use technology to facilitate this access without actually sacrificing the desire for or the importance for people to see the art firsthand? Uh, and then how do we do that when that I'm the dedicated digital staff person for the museum? So. What I had to do is basically start to create a roadmap, and the first thing I did was to audit the museum's infrastructure, um, looking at how what we're doing, and then also looking at how patrons were interacting with us. Uh, I was also looking at our business plan, uh, and one of the things that happened as a result of moving to uh, this new sort of expanded mission with illustration art is that we started to grow our business from just being a destination venue to an institution that actually creates, organizes, produces, and travels exhibitions. And oftentimes these exhibitions won't actually be on view in our museum. They just go out into the world. Um, the other thing was, how do I do this so that I can balance it between um, developing things in-house and using third-party services? Um, and another thing that was just sort of important to me, I come, my background before the Norman Rockwell Museum is I worked for the Boston Symphony Orchestra, so I had access to all these great schools in Boston, and we used a lot of students to work with us to build a lot of innovative uh, projects, and so what was important to me was how can I work with learning institutions to help realize what we wanted to do here. Um, the other thing was is that, um, Looking at our museum as a physical structure and the fact that we have expanded our mission, um, we're basically running out of space at our museum with all this expanded collection now between Rockwell and the illustration art. And so I have to work in a way so that I can actually reuse, reuse, reuse technology as best I can. And so because there's actually no place for me to put it. Um, and then the other thing was how can we make it fun and how can we continually innovate? Uh, one of the things about me is that I don't want to be hitting people on the head uh, with stuff. I'm trying to sort of proselytize things. I want to try to make it so that the experience at a museum is going to be fun, but also educational. So uh, I want to just bring out one note about uh, being a museum of illustration, is that while we own our collection, we don't own the intellectual property of the images that, uh, that are on those paintings. And so one of the challenges we have is that, um, you know, one of the first things that comes to mind is how can we monetize this? How can we start selling this stuff? The fact of the matter is, is that if we were to try to monetize this outright, it becomes a murky thing because now we have to go to all the different rights holders and get permissions and find, find some sort of um, business plan that, that's uh, equitable for everyone. So what we end up doing is trying to create um, these, uh, what I would call free educational experiences and then leveraging sponsors and institutional partners to help us uh, fund this. So that's one thing I just wanted to point out. Um, the museum, uh, for being a small museum, has actually been digitizing its collection since 2003. And they've been doing a phenomenal job about doing that. But one of the things that their priority has been is just been capturing the content, but not necessarily knowing what to do with that content once it's already been captured and archived. Uh, and so when I came on board, the uh, collection management system was great for the purposes of servicing the staff, but it wasn't great for uh, necessarily for researchers or even for people like me who want to try to uh, make that, expose that content and make that content actionable. And so we had to do a lot of work to upgrade our collection management system, 
to find a collections management system with a robust API that would allow us to tap into it uh, very easily. Um, the other thing that we also had to look at was how could we, um, we didn't have much in the way of a digital asset management system, we didn't have anything in the cloud, and so a lot of that work was also moving towards how can we get this content somewhere so that it's not <coughs> something that people have to come in through our sort of technology, our, our internet connection, and be limited by that. I mean, if you go out to the bursters, all it takes is one storm, and everything's, we're out of business. So it's, it's really important to find ways to get that content up onto uh, the cloud. The other thing was is that we had very dated internet access, and we had Wi-Fi capacity issues. So if I wanted to start to find ways where I could bring people in and start to use our Wi-Fi, we had to find ways to make those improvements. So these are some of the things that we did. Um, I think some of the big things was improving our internet access. I mean, if anyone is acquainted with internet access, we were on what was called a bonded key three. And, and that's really kind of like a MacGyver version of like a really strong uh, DSL line. So we moved to a fiber optic connection and we increased our Wi-Fi and we reconfigured it so that people could roam the museum and the grounds um, and be able to connect with technology uh, more easily. So uh, the other thing that we did was started to look at what patrons were doing. Uh, a lot of patrons bring their phones to the museum and we felt like rather than coming up with all these different pieces of technology that we would then have to loan out to people, why not try to find ways to connect them with their own phones? Uh, and so that was one priority that we wanted to move towards. Uh, another thing was that people were, less and less people were coming to our website, less people were actually using email, more people were actually going on social media to learn about stuff. Um, initially, uh, the way I kind of equate Norman Rockwell on social media is like, for people who like Norman Rockwell, and how many people are acquainted with Norman Rockwell? Let me ask that. Oh good, there's, that's great. Uh, but for people who really love Norman Rockwell, he might as well be a puppy dog or kitten on, on, on social media because it's like we could post something about anything and then as soon as we put a Norman Rockwell image, we get like a, a few hundred likes immediately. Yeah. And so uh, we discovered that we needed to try to uh, find ways to connect people through social media. Uh, people love the audio video content. We have uh, a good example of uh, our collection, our digital collection that was not actionable was that we, over the course of probably 20, 30 years, we've captured these oral histories uh, by people who were models of Norman Rockwell. And we've captured oral histories interviews by artists. So we've got interviews galore. But our collection system couldn't handle it. And so we had to migrate to a new system so that we could get that content out there. And I'll show you an example of how we've done that. Um, and basically, uh, the other thing that we were discovering was that teachers we're actually connecting with our collection and using Rockwell's content and then now the newly additional added uh, illustration content to use that content in their curriculum. And I'm talking not just like middle school and high school, but like kindergarten teachers and first grader, first grade teachers were using this content to, to create curriculum in uh, their schools. Uh, and the other thing was more and more schools are using mobile devices Chromebooks and stuff like that. And so we had to find ways where we could actually just make it so it's very easy for them to get the right content. So I then looked at the business plan. As I mentioned, we have a traveling exhibition uh, uh, sort of business plan that's now, I want to say about 20 to 30% of our business. And um, one of the things that we were finding was that uh, we weren't getting people necessarily connecting back to us at the museum. It's like they went to the show and they were like, oh, that's great, and they went home and that was it. So we had to find ways to connect to them. Uh, we were looking at our own museum. So our own museum is a, a nice, beautiful museum, but it is it has a finite amount of space so that when we do some exhibitions, especially some more um, ambitious exhibitions, we're still limited by the amount of physical space that we have in our museum. So we had to find ways to connect people to that content that we couldn't show. Uh, our audio tour was uh, extremely dated. Uh, it was expensive to manage. It was expen expensive to, to update, and we were having uh, we were finding more and more people where English was not a first language was coming to the museum, and so we had to find ways to connect to them. So there's all of this stuff. Um, 
coming down on me and, and then really just sort of understanding what the train was in terms of how were we going to make something work at our museum. And so uh, I started to sort of act as a project manager and working with different people within our museum who had the sort of skill sets that I needed that weren't technology or digital skill sets, but people, knowledge uh, leaders, thought leaders, uh, who had that content and information that could actually make it easier for me to put things together. Uh, we started working with digital agencies, and I'll talk about one that's here in Boston that we started working with. Uh, but most importantly, we developed a relationship with the school. Uh, it is not on the East Coast, it's on the West Coast, and I'll explain to you why. Um, and then, uh, basically, uh, that's about it. So, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the things that we've been doing at the museum. Some of them are kind of old school, but the, the thing is, is that there is actually some merit to, to some degree in doing old school stuff because people find that really so one of the things that we did, not this past summer, but the previous summer was an exhibition uh, that spans 500 years of art. Uh, and the, and the, the premise of the exhibition was to look at this lineage of artists who have served as teachers and students. So if we think of Norman Rockwell as sort of the end point, who was his teacher? And who was his teacher's teacher? And so we had a, a, a person, uh, an artist, an illustrator, a scholar, uh, illustrator and curator who came to us and said, I've created this unbroken chain of artists that go back um, oh, pretty much 500 years that, that show all the different people that basically came down the line to create Norman Rockwell as an artist. And so we had 50 plus paintings on loan, drawn, and some of it was drawn from the collection. There were 70 artists, but we only had four galleries. And so the challenge was, how can we get all those artists represented in the exhibition? Uh, and, and, and some of it was space, but some of it was also cost. It's kind of hard to get someone to loan Leonardo da Vinci to the Norman Rockwell Museum in Western Mass. Uh, so we had to find ways to connect that way. Uh, so we, uh, the opportunities was to make the, make the artists uh, available. Um, also provide a portfolio of their images, and we were also, uh, we secured a grant to get this huge eight-foot touch screen that allowed us to then show the artwork in as close uh, to the original size for many of these art pieces of art as possible so that people could actually see what that art looked like uh, in, its, in its as close to original glory as possible. Uh, the thing that was just really impressive about this uh, this interactive was the fact that during the time that the museum is open for business, it was used 90% of the time. So it just, and, and it just it was constantly being used. And so this is just this is something that we try to strive for. We just don't want to have interactives up for the purposes of having something digital there. We want something where people are going to use it. So this is the interactive. Um, and so you'll see 70 plus uh, uh, Artists starting over here in 1416, going all the way through to um, to Norman Rockwell, NCY, Maxwell Parish, and basically it was this. This was it. Um, and what was great about this was that it also invited multiple users to partake in the experience um, and be able to explore it together. And this is just another example of a, an interactive we created. So for an exhibition we did on uh, the cartoons of Hanna-Barbera, uh, they created over 500 characters. And so we thought it would be kind of cool to create a little interactive where you could ex at least explore 300 of them. And so you could see the work that was done uh, as a result of about 70 years of creating content. So the next thing that we created was we updated our audio tour. This is um, by a company called Cuseum. They're based here in Boston. Um, what's important about this is that it, it not only services the, the museum, but it services all of our traveling exhibitions, and it also services all of our exhibitions that are no longer on view. So it becomes almost like a little selling tool for the museum. Um, what was really important about this is that um, 
it's amazing. I've been to a number of museums across the country and a lot of museums still use like the old-fashioned audio tour where you have to plug in a number and then you have to either listen to it or you have headphones and stuff like that. And uh, if we were to start to sort of follow that model of uh, doing that, we would never have the right numbering system and numbers, numbering scheme. And so what was important was to come up with a way to make it so that people could connect to the artwork as quickly as possible without having to kind of like finagle pushing numbers and that stuff. Um, so it was important to do that. It was important to have languages uh, on this. And we, it was also important to make it so that um, many audio tour apps at the time that we created this, and this is just back in 2016, were for, for, for iOS devices only. And so it was important that we create something that would be cover every, as many <coughs> mobile devices as possible. Um, the challenge is, is that uh, I didn't want to be a person to be developing this in-house. I didn't want to be responsible for having to make the app work every time Apple and, and Google came out with a new update on the operating system. I wanted somebody else, I wanted to pay someone to do that. And so that was, that was the prime motivator from, from doing this in-house to looking for a third party to work on it. Um, the opportunities, as I mentioned, were all the things that I spoke of, but one of the things that we wanted to try doing, uh, and there was only a few museums at the time in 2015 doing this, we wanted to use image recognition to, to trigger the content. So rather than sitting there typing in a number, you could use the camera on your phone in the app and hold it up to the painting, and it would trigger the content, and you're, you're up and running right away. Um, and that has become a game changer because that has become so actively used for especially all of our traveling exhibitions. Um, so one of the things I'll just point out is that this came out in 2018 and we've had over 70,000 installations in the app. Um, if you think about it, um, you know, we get about 120,000 people at the museum each year. Uh, so it's not a bad start. Uh, it's a free app. Uh, it services eight exhibitions. Right now it's servicing uh, five exhibitions concurrently. Um, what I'm seeing, and we have a lot of metrics that we can measure how people are using this, and you know, like we do things like the moment they walk in, we capture their, their MAC address so that you can see, you know, if we can actually see when they, surf, they actually got content from the app and we can see that they're capturing content before they come. Sometimes they're looking at it afterwards. So it's become a, a, almost one of our godsend tools that we've been using. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is that um, instead of having like a traditional picture in a classroom setting and doing something, we're seeing a lot of teachers, especially in Berkshire County, where they're using this uh, on an iPad and, and serving up content so that they can learn about X, Y, and Z. Um, some of the downsides to this uh, is that uh, we, our old-fashioned audio tour thing was six bucks a pop, and people were now bringing their own phones and downloading it for free, so we lost all that revenue. Uh, but I don't really care because I was more important about, it was more important for me to get making this more accessible. Um, the other thing is, is that we also incorporated functionality in here so that people can make donations. We've had one donation. On, on this app, so it's it's not a money maker in any way, um, and I, I you know it's actually kind of fun because now we just wait for the next time someone might actually make a donation. But most of the time, uh, we find ways to get that that revenue elsewhere. Uh, the other big thing was the the Wi-Fi. Uh, when you go, our our peak seasons are from June to October through October. And you know, like on a day like today, especially where it's kind of iffy out, we'll probably have 20 tour buses at our museum today. Uh, and so this became a huge bottleneck on our Wi-Fi. And so we had to completely overhaul the Wi-Fi, partition public-private, and, and, and look at how um, the devices were connecting to the access points. Um, one of the big things that I, I mean, like, iOS is great and Apple devices are great, but they're really persnickety about the handshake with an access point and they don't let go. And what that just simply means is like if someone comes into their museum into our lobby and connects with their phone uh, and then they walk deeper into our museum, it's still trying to connect to that access point in the lobby. And so we had to do a lot of work to kick them off for that access point and move them around. 
So there was a lot of other work that we had to do to kind of make this all happen. Actually, one other thing that I'll just point out is that this is becoming ubiquitous. Everybody pretty much has a, or not everybody, but a lot. Uh, and what I discovered was that some of our older patrons have these phones and all they knew how to do is make a phone call and maybe check email. Uh, part, maybe make a text, do, do a text. No one knew their password to get the download the app off the app store. Uh, they had no idea what swiping meant, all that stuff. So it became a whole new learning curve that we had to do to sort of train our staff to train the patrons. But this is just an example of it where you can go up and scan the image. Um, here's an example of how we, the same content is now being served up in multiple languages. Um, I just put these labels here so that you could, you know, in case, you know, I don't know, <laughs> in case you didn't know that was Chinese, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, the other thing is that the audio content, now we can serve up not just like the simple one track of audio content, but we can also start to pull content from our collection. So now we have like this in, in this example uh, with the family tree that Rockwell painted, we actually have recordings of him from the 50s that were in our collection untapped because we had no idea they were there and we didn't know how to tap them to get them into the system. So this became a really important uh, sort of proving grounds to show how we could connect the collection to uh, something that people were using. Same thing with the video content. So this woman here, Mary Whalen, is the model for the girl in the mirror. And so this gives people the opportunity not to only hear just the sort of standard pre-produced audio tour, but they can also hear the models in their own words. Um, this is me. I'm going to save you the trouble of watching this video using this, but basically um, I can demo this uh, if you like <laughs> afterwards, but I just sort of demo how you can use the phone and connect and, and, and uh, access the content. So this is actually uh, old school. This is old school, and I actually included this for a reason because this was actually one of the main inspiration and motivators for why we did VR. So uh, we have this traveling exhibition that's going on now. It's in France, um, and it's been to Detroit, New York, Washington, D.C., uh, France. I'm trying to think there was another place. I'm blanking. Uh, it's going to go to Houston, Denver, and then it's coming back. And one of the things that we wanted to do, and this goes back to creating context, so you've got this exhibition that's got over 300 paintings and objects in it of stuff that are up on walls and under cases, and they're all things like newspapers and comic books and, and donation jars and, and war bond posters and stuff like that, and propaganda posters, and the, all you have are the labels to explain to you what they are, but they don't provide the broader context. So we wanted to create an experience where people could come in and sort of get a sense of, of how people may have lived and, and, and get a sense of how people may have communicated this stuff back in the day. So we created a, um, I'll just show you, this is just a simple thing. It's a little living room that we recreated. Very old school. One thing I'll point out is that uh, museums <coughs> keep this up. Patrons keep this up. Um, we actually had to purchase a love seat and a design a love seat to look like it was from 1940 that would withstand over 20,000 people sitting on it. So I mean, it just that's the kind of stuff that people just they eat up, and and they and but it, it's important because they um, they get a sense they get grounded in the exhibition, and then it becomes easier for them to then consume the stuff that's on the wall. Um, not a big doesn't seem like a big deal, but we just did this for a 1969 exhibit that's at our museum, and we just made this little console TV. And I'm not kidding you, this is, this is not a staged shot. This is actually all the time. People are sitting there watching ads, commercials, movie trailers from 1969 on this old Is that the Wild Bunch? That is uh, the Wild Bunch, yes. <laughs> so, so, uh, Ernest Morgan. Ernest Morgan, yes. So, but it's also the year that you know, Sesame Street came out in, yeah. in 1969. So it's been, and so we have episodes of, of Sesame Street and stuff like that up there. So people eat this stuff up. So we then started to move into how can we start to virtualize this? And so one of the things that we did is we created the 360 degree video studio tour of Rockwell Studio. That's on our property. 
Uh, it is not winterized, and so it's not open during the winter months, and a lot of people complain because they can't go in. And so we wanted to do something where we could start to create uh, an experience for them so that they <coughs> could uh, get a sense of what the studio was and how, what was in it. And so we produced this 20 minute tour with our chief curator walking around showing you the studio. Um, I, I say, we, I, I, I wanted to bring this up too because this was done in 2016 and while that's only like three years ago, um, that is really archaic uh, video equipment to shoot uh, 360 video. And at the time there wasn't even like, even really suitable um, video editing software to, to really do things like, you know, we recorded her, this, this, the curator in the space and we recorded her in the space and then we also had her geared up to with a mic and to a digital recorder, but we had to pair that stuff and it just was kind of monumental trying to make that all work with just some of the, you know, with Premiere or Filecoin or anything at the time in 2016. So it took a lot of finagling to make this all work. Um, but the other thing was, how could we show this in the museum setting? Because this was effectively like, we, you know, there was uh, Oculus Rift, there was a Vive, uh, but you know, we're a small museum and we can't just be spending, you know, $600 with a big rig somewhere so that people can watch a 20 minute video because there's not gonna be a lot of turnover. And so we were trying to figure out how can we make this work uh, in our museum uh, at the time. And so we were like, do we use a headset? Do we use the phone? You know, can we go around and start looking around at the studio doing this kind of thing? Or should we use a touch screen? Where should we put it? Should it be in a gallery? Should it be in the classroom? Should it be in the lobby? The irony is that we tried all these things. The lobby was the best place for this. And the other thing I'll say is that um, we put it on, at the time, it was a Samsung um, Galaxy View, which is about an 18-inch tablet. And we just put it on there, and we just told people you could swipe around and do stuff. And they just sat there, and we had big crowds looking at it, you know, doing it. And, and it became, uh, uh, it was great because, you know, our visitor service people weren't getting the complaints that they couldn't go in the studio. People love this. Um, at the time, uh, even YouTube at the time in 2016, um, they were doing VR, but it was still not great. Uh, and, and people weren't quite getting it. Um, but this year when we started doing our VR, we started showing it on like, the Oculus Go uh, using the, the YouTube VR app and people started getting it and people loved it. And so. It's, 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 it's sort of building up uh, momentum and, and interest, but to be honest with you, that has been our only foray into 360 degree video. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is that um, when you go to our museum, you listen to a docent speak, they can speak like you wouldn't believe, and they speak better than I can, but the moment I stick a camera in front of them, all of a sudden they're like, dur, 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 and then you, know, you can't do it without having multiple takes. Uh, and what we wanted to do was try to find something that was much more authentic. Uh, and so we haven't done a lot with it. Um, it's something that I'm probably gonna go back to. Um, we're starting to work or consider doing master classes with artists, and so this is an opportunity where we could have the artist uh, working on something and then there could be another artist sort of learning from them or her and, and finding ways to connect uh, that way. Um, so the next thing I just want to talk about is that we created this relationship with the Academy of Art University, which is in San Francisco. Uh, when we started thinking about doing the Four Freedoms exhibition, um, it came out in 2018, but uh, I came on board in 2015, and we were already talking about building this massive exhibition. And we were trying to think of a way to connect with people uh, and connect all of this content in a way. Uh, we had tons of magazines and comic books and all this stuff, and I was just kind of annoyed by the fact that no one could pick them up and read them. And so I wanted to find a way to, to do something. And so we started talking about VR. Um, I actually came back to Boston and talked to a number of schools, including MIT, and you know, didn't really get a sense that that was uh, in people's wheelhouses at the time. It wasn't like there wasn't an, like there were people who were working in a VR, but there weren't people who were working in. Um, they were mostly working in 360 video. There weren't a lot of people who were kind of gamifying the VR experience, so that there were some interactions. Uh, and so we started looking there. We started looking in New York. 
Uh, and I started up looking at digital agencies. Um, I was getting quotes of like $3 million to build this VR experience for the Four Freedoms exhibition, which is, to give you a sense, that's more than half of the cost of the exhibition budget to travel all this artwork all over the world. So I'm sitting there like, this is not gonna happen. And so I started thinking about how can we connect possibly on the West Coast and how would a relationship like that work given that we're this small museum in Western Mass and you know, they're out on the West Coast. Uh, turns out that on our national council, so they're not, he's not a trustee, but the uh, Chuck Pyle, who's the director of illustration at the Academy of Art, is on our national council, and he invited me to talk to one of his colleagues who was the head of the game and development school. Uh, I talked with them. They're like, yeah, we can do this with our eyes closed. We, we're not, you know, this is something we can do, no problem, big, no big deal. And I'm sitting here after hearing, like, it's going to cost me $3 million. No one's doing it. It's, there's no concerted effort. It's going to be stretched out over four years. How are we going to make this all happen? How can this be that there's this place on the West Coast that can do it? No problem. So I went out there, and I talked to them. And they introduced me to all these different schools at the Academy of Art University. And that's when I realized that we could actually make this work. And so uh, we started developing the VR project for the Four Freedoms Exhibition. Uh, but that has now sort of dovetailed into other things. Um, one of the things that we did was we created this interactive painting. I wanted to get a sense, I wanted to give them a small project to sort of to get a sense of what they could do. So we created this interactive <coughs> painting for an exhibition that opened in the fall of 2017. And I wanted to see you know, what could be possible. So I connected them with Tony DiGiulisi, who was the artist that we were, whose work we were showing. Um, Tony DiGiulisi was known for doing some of the early work for Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering. He has done, he, he wrote and illustrated um, the Spiderwick Chronicles, uh, and he's done a number of other things. And so I connected them, him, them with him. Um, I even went out with Tony to San Francisco and, and, and they got to meet him. And we wanted to kind of come up with this sort of painting in the exhibition that would be uh, just something fun, kind of like a Harry Potter painting where you would see like a Tony DiGiulisi character on the wall and it'd be sitting there, and then the moment you walked in front of it, the character would start to interact with you. And so uh, we wanted to, to try that. We used uh, the Microsoft Xbox Connect sensor to sort of trigger the interactions and to get a sense of what people were doing. Um, and the other thing I had to con sort of convince people, especially at the museum, was that there, there was no educational value to this whatsoever. It was just something fun. I wanted to sort of see how people would react and how, what people would do. So uh, the other challenge is, is that we had three months to produce it. We had to determine the extent of the interactions. What degree of realism? Do we, do we try to make it look real? Because some of Tony's work is very real, some of it's very stylized. Um, and then uh, the other big thing is like towards the end of the project, Microsoft comes out and says, we're not gonna support this anymore. And so uh, we had to go by what we had been doing. Um, we had been in active uh, communications with Microsoft. And they were helping us out with a number of things. Um, but you know, it was a fun, it was immersive. Um, things that we learned is that this painting was really disruptive. People didn't like, I mean, people who wanted to go there for a museum didn't like the fact that there was this thing there interacting with them. Um, the other thing is that because we only did it, we only had three months to build it, it was very limited in scope, and so the interactions were pretty much limited to about two minutes of activity, people just moved on. Which, you know, someone in the museum world would be like, oh, that's not great, but for me, I'm like, two minutes, that's great, that's awesome. Um, older patrons did not get it at all. But the interesting thing is, is that the Academy of Art goes to Comic-Con and we demoed it at Comic-Con, and we had tons of people playing with it, and it was just amazing. So what was an eye-opener was that there was this whole group of audience that had no clue who we were playing with something that we did, and it was really tremendous. And uh, the other thing that it scored for us was that then we were invited, like they're like, Norman Rockwell Museum at Comic-Con? That's really cool. Would you guys like to do a talk at Comic-Con? And next thing we know, we're, we're doing a talk, and we filled a, we're trying, what do we do? So we created uh, a talk with Tony DiGiulisi and Frank Miller, 
and a thousand people came, and then more people came back to the booth where they could play with the thing. It was just amazing. So this is just an example of what that painting looked like, and the, and the three different character interactions. Um, this is Tony Dietrichlitzi working with the students uh, and trying to come up with ways to do things. This is actually a promo video that uh, Academy of Art built uh, just to show how they were working on it. Um, this is the talk. I, I, I know this has no relevance to VR and AR and that stuff, but this was just like, <coughs> this was like the gravy. This was the whipped cream on top of the sundae. This was awesome. This was great because we just got people knowing that Norman Rockwell Museum wasn't just about Norman Rockwell, but it was about a much broader and bigger world. Um, and this is uh, the booth that we're, where we were at. And to give you a sense of why, <laughs> what, what, how frugal we are in Berkshire County, um, this was me dismantling this and then realizing, oh, we had an exhibition for video for the next exhibition, so I'm just gonna stick it in the end. <laughs> and people love that. And so that has become the mantra of like, how can we reuse all this stuff? Knowing that technology changes constantly, but TVs don't, so uh, I figured that's an easy way to, to connect the dots. So I get to the uh, VR project. Um, we are doing some work in augmented reality. It's coming out in a few months, and I can't really show much about it um, because uh, what we're doing is next month we open up a new exhibition um, of four artists who um, tell their memoirs about coming to the United States. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an immigration exhibition. And there's this one artist who does these amazing um, prints, uh, uh, illustrations and prints, um, um, linoleum prints, cut prints. And then she starts creating like this 3D art that comes out of it. So it's almost like a pop-up book, but it's on a wall. And you open it up and it unfolds and all this stuff. And you know what we were trying to figure out was how can we show that? Uh, that the stuff opens up and stuff because it's going to be on the wall and it's going to be behind stanchions and no one can touch it. So what can we do to sort of illustrate that? So we're working on something that will allow people to pick up a device and hold it in front of the artwork and they'll be able to see how the artwork kind of unfolds. And so we'll be using augmented reality for that. The reason why I don't have anything to show is that it was actually, it took a little finessing with the artist to allow us to do that. So that's just an example of, you know, we're messing with their art. We're doing something a little different. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that uh, they were cool with it. And then once we got them cool with it, we're only a month away, so we can't really get it all done in the way that we really want to do it. So it'll could be, oh, the exhibition runs for about six months, and so two months into it, we'll, we'll unveil this. The VR. So I get back to the, the VR and this exhibition, 300 Paintings and Objects. The average age of the material is 75 years old. Um, and what we're trying to do in this exhibition is that there are four themes for the exhibition. So one is to understand the time, the people, the issues from which the four freedoms emerged. So there are Norman Rockwell's four freedoms paintings, but he did that in response to Franklin Delano Roosevelt declaring <coughs> the four freedoms in his 1941 State of the Union speech. And so we wanted to kind of understand, we wanted to convey why it was important for Rockwell to create these four freedoms. And, and why it was such an important thing in his career. Uh, we also wanted to show how Rockwell has this uncanny ability to take these abstract concepts and turn them into images that people understand. So um, when you look at uh, freedom of speech, uh, which is one of the four freedoms paintings, it shows a man standing up in a crowd, voicing his opinion and everyone's listening. And that's the value, like that to him, Rockwell was like, this is the epitome of of free speech that, you know, you can, and this was depicting like a, a town meeting in Vermont. And well, we all think of people in Vermont as being really nice people. If you go to any annual town meeting in, in New England, it's pretty contentious and pretty, people are pretty nasty to each other, at least nowadays. He went to this town meeting and they were talking about building a new school. His neighbor, a farmer, living paycheck to paycheck was like, I can't afford the taxes on it. He stood up and voiced his opinion against building the school. Everyone listened to him, he sat down, and then they proceeded to vote to build the school anyway. But Rockwell was just really impressed that people just let him talk. And so this is what kind of inspired him. So when you start thinking of like freedom of speech, freedom from want, freedom from fear, 
freedom of worship, you know, like how do you paint that? And so this is just, this goes into like how Rockwell, it goes into Rockwell's artistic process to kind of create these images. We also look at how um, people have responded to Rockwell's images and specifically the Four Freedoms. So in the Four Freedoms, uh, the Four Freedoms were published in 1943 uh, in Saturday Evening Post and the Saturday Evening Post had to immediately issue another, uh, I forget, it's like tens of thousands of, of reprints because people wanted it. And then next thing we know, that the Treasury Department wants to do a war bonds tour with these images to raise money to support for the war effort. And they go on to raise, I think, 132 million, which is about 1.8 billion in today's dollars. So it's just, it just shows that people were responding to Rockwell's images. And the way it all worked was that the Four Freedoms went on tour, people bought a war bond, and in exchange you got print. Simple as that. Um, and then the other thing we wanted to do is convey the actual ideals of the four freedoms and, and, and why they're important and why they're still important today. So here are our challenges. So we started in January of 2017, and during that time, uh, the core VR technology changes three times. So we started working on something, and then we had to change gears, and then we had to change gears again. Um, at the time, the really good VR experiences, um, things that would be able to service up all the content we wanted to do was going to be on, a, on a, an Oculus Rift or on a, on a Vive. But the downside to that is the expense and having this big cable tethered to people. And, and it was just one of those challenges like, what do we do? So that was one question we came up with. Um, the other thing is, is that working with the school, and this is something that I experienced here in Boston, and it's everywhere, is that you know semesters are finite, and there's student turnover, so how do you deal with that? And so we had to find a way to commit the students to working on the project beyond the semester time frame. Uh, what are the, uh, what's the learning curve that we needed to deal with? So knowing that someone's gonna come into an exhibition and sit down and maybe sit with it for 10 minutes, how, how long are they gonna, I mean, what, what's it gonna take for them to actually understand the experience? and to immerse themselves into it and start consuming the content. Um, what are the interactions we want to feature? How real do we want to make the visuals? Um, how much content should we include? Um, what's a satisfactory amount of time for someone to use the experience and come out of it and go see the rest of the exhibition and have it have meaning? Um, <coughs> another big one is how do you staff the experience? And um, the, the big thing for me was how does this experience complement the experience of going and seeing art on a wall? How does it make people bring value to those pe to people doing that? Um, the opportunities was now we could actually build an experience where people could jump into the Four Freedoms. Uh, they could interact directly with also, the whole thing is if you go into the, the VR experience, I would say 75% of the content in there is in our show and the exhibition, but now you can actually interact with the objects directly. Um, it was a, bit, a way to interact and get people to uh, contemporary artists, artists um, sort of audiences, to connect with 75-year-old material. Uh, the other thing that it was an opportunity for was to sort of rearrange how we had our relationship with the Academy of Art, and they actually changed their whole structure over there so that all the students became their own digital agency. And now they actually have this digital agency and they do these projects for all these different institutions. Um, and then how can we, and, and the other thing is, is that we wanted to incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion touch points into the experience. And the best people to do that were the students. Um, we had basically the United Nations of students working on this project uh, from all over the world. And so how can we get them to feel good about the work that they were doing? And, and, and how, what could they include in that? Uh, and then the other thing was, and this sort of came in midstream, connecting the VR experience to the curriculum. Um, so some of the decisions, decision points is that rather than using um, an Oculus Rift or a Vive, we decided to go with a Samsung Galaxy S8. This was cutting edge in 2017, cutting edge. It's now three, two, three versions uh, old. Um, we also realized that 
uh, virtual, virtual reality is its own reality. Now this is, for those of you working in VR, it's probably not a big thing, but for people in the museum world, you know, people are sitting there like, how are you gonna make this look real? How are you gonna make this feel like this is someone's in a different world? And I'm like, just put it on and you're gonna find that you're, you've, you've already moved to a new reality. And so we didn't have to go crazy with creating these really ultra realistic environments. We could go focus on creating things that complemented the exhibition. Um, the other thing, because we had to make it simple, was to simplify the interaction. So we used gaze activation. And that just simply means that you, you know, when you move your head onto something, there's a little reticule in the middle of the screen. And as you focus something onto that object and linger there for a few minutes, it will activate the object. Um, but then when we started getting into more complex objects, so like if you're looking at something and you really wanted to look at an image and have it zoom up to you and look at stuff, that's pretty straightforward. But when you wanted to like look at a book and start flipping pages and moving things around, we actually had to use, we had to create these sort of, um, what I would call these sequenced gaze interactions to kind of activate that object. So opening up the book would be looking at it, but then there would be these things so that they could flip the pages, stuff like that. Uh, it, it's just stuff that you know we learned um, very quickly. I, at least I learned. Um, the other thing is, is that in some of the early, we, we um, did a lot of user testing. We did a lot of focus groups. We brought this to schools, to, to uh, first and second grade classes. We brought them to senior centers. Um, and, and, and the way it worked was that you would basically look at some place, so the gaze interaction would like, if you're in an environment and you looked at some place, it would take you to it. And we discovered the act of moving in a VR experience without actually physically moving was making people sick. Uh, and we couldn't have people being sick in the museum setting. And so we started using the teleporting function so that when you looked at a place, it would teleport you there and you sort of, it would sort of fade out and fade back in, voila, you're at this new place. Um, the other thing was is that we wanted to, to ensure that we wouldn't have people just sort of usurping uh, the experience in the, in the museum setting. Uh, we, we kept the content to about 10 minutes per painting, but then as we were working on this over 18 months, we were realizing that more and more schools found this more interesting uh, than we thought, uh, and to the point that the value of the VR experience in a school setting was starting to outweigh the value of the experience of the, the VR in a museum setting. So then we started finding ways to reuse a lot, you, reuse a lot of the um, interactions and add more content into the experience. So going from 10 minutes or 40 minutes of total content to now there's about six hours worth of content in the experience um, all on a phone. And so it was just something that we had to kind of work towards. Um, some of the results, uh, when we started talking to the venues that were going to be showing the exhibition, uh, a lot of the museum directors were really intimidated by VR. They were just like, no way. There's no, I mean, the first place that we opened at was in New York, and I thought, this is going to be super easy. New York's going to want to do VR. Um, and this is not anything against them, uh, but what we discovered was like, they were like, no, we don't want to do VR because we don't have the staff. We're worried about people running into the artwork. We're, you know, they, they created every sort of bad edge case scenario for not using VR, that we ended up not doing the VR in New York. Um, but the thing is, is that what it comes down to is that if you're gonna do VR in a museum, you have to, I mean, for at least in my opinion, you have to staff it. If not for the safety of the patrons, but to also help them get <coughs> acclimated to it. And so um, staffing has been a challenge. Uh, the other thing is, is that these phones, when we started doing it, they were overheating. So after about 90 minutes, we literally would get people saying, it's burning my eyes. Mm. <laughs> and we're sitting there like, oh, okay. So we, we have to, and you know, we bought a number of devices so that we could like, you know, because these are running on battery, we could swap them out, but we were now swapping them out far more quickly than we anticipated. So we ended up having to buy three times the amount of equipment so that we could shuffle it in and out as quickly as possible. Um, but then after the first big show that we did it at uh, in DC, Oculus Go came out and I tried it out and I was like, this, this is like a no brainer uh, for this kind of experience because one, it doesn't over, it does overheat, but it needs, you need to be using it a long time for it to overheat. 
Two, it's much more comfortable. It's much more uh, self-contained. Um, it's actually got effectively the same technology as the phone, but the operating system is 100% devoted towards VR. And so uh, it allows you to do a whole lot more. And then the other thing is, is that this is $800. This is $20, and uh, you have to deal with the fact that this is getting updates, uh, operating system updates every like month. Uh, and this goes for $200. And so it became a no-brainer as to using this in the museum setting. Uh, the other thing that we, we did, we tried to build the experience so that it would have the widest range of audience. Uh, but what we realized was that kids under eight years old um, were really having a hard time. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interactions in here that have text uh, and so if kids can't read or have trouble reading they're not going to keep up and the other thing was that some of the concepts uh, they weren't they they were too difficult to grasp it wasn't because the concepts were old and 75 years old it was just like they just didn't quite get why people were doing this or the fact that like they went into a they they, they went they go into the living room and they're like where's the TV where's this where's that and they're like oh this this sucks and you know and so they're like no 1943, they didn't have that, you know? So you're trying to explain to them. So we, we discovered very quickly that uh, they weren't gonna, it's not gonna work for them. So just to give you a sense of the results though, we opened this at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. 30,000 people used this in three months. And what was really awesome about it was actually they used this in three months and I never got a call, like this isn't working, it's broken, blah, blah, blah. blah. They, they got it, and it was great, and it was awesome. The other thing was is that when we moved from Dearborn to D.C., um, some people uh, caught wind on Capitol Hill that we had VR, and so they invited us to the Capitol Hill to demo the VR to members of the House of Representatives and their staff. So it was like all of a sudden, like, this opened up a whole new world of... of the doors sort of opened up to, to people that would, know, would normally never ever make their way to the museum. Uh, the other thing is, is that we expected kids to really like this, and we thought it would be like overwhelmingly kids would be doing this, but it's about a 60-40 split with 40% being over the age of 60. So people really, you know, older folks really, the, what was really amazing was that people would come up to us saying, I've never used VR, but I really want to try it. And I was like, well, and they're like, but Norman Rockwell seems to be the easiest and most thing, you know, welcoming thing that I could think of to try VR. So they tried VR, and that was that was great. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, when we brought it to our museum, and we have it at our museum, we had to start to incorporate VR into the operating plan. So uh, we had to find ways to introduce it into our our, our programming. Um, so we offer it two days a week. 100 to 300 people use it a day. We had to hire staff for it. Um, I knew we were gonna have to hire staff eventually because this exhibition comes back to us next year, but uh, we ended up starting it sooner rather than later, and it's been tremendous. Uh, if you've ever been to Berkshire County, there's a bunch of cultural institutions out there, and all of a sudden we're getting phone calls saying, hey, can you bring your VR to, to Tanglewood and show them you know, this, and can you bring it to this and that and go to Pittsfield? And so all of a sudden we were out doing like this tour of VR, so it, it it's, what I will just say is that it's it's it, it's it's gone beyond my expectations of what it can it can offer us, um, and then the big thing is is that we started showing this to teachers in Berkshire County, and all of a sudden um, they're using these things, and I've actually donated a lot of these things to the schools because we don't use these anymore. So um, this is Dearborn. Uh, <laughs> Just to give you a sense of how popular VR was there, is that this guy is a plumber at Henry Ford Museum. He heard there was VR, and on his break, he came over and tried it out. And so I had to take a picture of him playing with it. Um, this is actually another popular, so kids and people still don't quite get the VR thing, and so people put it on, and all of a sudden they want to start grabbing things and moving towards things. So this is, this is a classic thing uh, that it happens. You'll notice that we put them on, we sit them down, because when they start standing, they get dizzy, and they, even when there's not much motion. But we sit them down, we put them in swivel chairs so they can swivel around. Um, this is me talking to a six-year-old, and this is just giving you an example. I had to show this picture because this is like anybody who's under eight years old, I'm like, 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's a radio. Yep, yeah, there's no TV. <laughs> uh, so this is one of the reasons why we kind of decided that okay, maybe young kids. We have to come up with a new VR experience that's going to make the young kids really like that, and that's what we're working on for the summer. Um, the other thing was, even though we put them in swivel chairs, people didn't get it. And this, so this is in on Capitol Hill, and so this person's sitting in the chair, and you know, rather than swiveling, she's doing this kind of craning her neck to look around and stuff. And we're like, you can swivel, you can, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so it's just an interesting thing uh, that we encountered. So these are some screenshots from it. Uh, so this is our Four Freedoms Gallery. Uh, so this is Freedom from Fear, uh, where the two parents are tucking the kids into bed. And what we wanted to do is make it so that in this experience, you get a sense of the time and place of the 1940s. So when you go into the painting, you jump into the bedroom uh, and you can interact with objects. So there's, and we didn't know how much we would need to prompt people to like look at things, and so we started labeling them. Um, so when you open up the book, you see a video, you can flip through the book. Um, in, what, in Freedom of Worship, you can jump into uh, Rockwell Studio. So here's just a simple uh, 360 image that we then layered objects and information on there. Uh, and you can learn about how he created his paintings. Um, in Freedom From Want, we show the response of people to Freedom From Want. And then one of the big things that's happened over the course of time is that people have parodied Rockwell. So in this gallery, you can actually go up and look at all these different parodies of Rockwell. So these are all parodies of Freedom From Want. Here's uh, the problem we all live with, with some parodies that people have done. Um, both for, and it's interesting, like um, when, you know, an example, the picture there is uh, the problem that still exists, and it shows a young girl, this young girl, walking past a big pile of rubble in Baltimore mm -hmm. after the race riots. Um, when Betsy DeVos was uh, uh, nominated to become Department of Education Secretary, uh, a, a conservative illustrator wanted to show how she was being, you know, People were antagonizing her, and so they, they created this. Uh, and then this another one, this is a, a gentleman from Vancouver, uh, Canada, where he wanted to sort of show what was beyond this picture, and so he created that, that sort of larger uh, in this illustration. Uh, in Freedom of Speech, uh, you go into the town hall meeting where Rockwell was inspired, um, and I finally relented and put a TV in. Now, there would never be a TV in a town hall, especially in, in Vermont in 1943, but we put a TV in there because uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was to show um, famous speeches in history that went up about freedom that kind of motivated people to make, and to inspire them to, 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 to change how they were living in, in their respective places. So it goes throughout history, throughout the world, and this was the opportunity where the students could actually um, do something really neat. So rather than actually show the speeches, so like you can't really show um, Sojourner Truth giving her speech, uh, her, her little oratory, or you can't show Abraham Lincoln, but the students decided to record themselves acting out the speeches. And this became an opportunity for them to show. So this is just an example of you know, so I'll just show you this quick video. There's no audio on this. Um, quickly, just an example of things that we had to include. Like <laughs> when we first did this in, in, in Dearborn, we actually had to put a video up there to explain to them what they were going to be getting into. Like we could just say, we're going to put this on, it's going to be great, it's going to be awesome, it's going to be magical. We had to ex explain to them that we weren't, you know, like doing anything crazy. So this sort of shows like the preliminary looking around, um, going in. You can look at labels, they zoom up to you. You can then jump in and then you can go into the space. Uh, you can pick up things. Uh, being a museum, everything has to be captioned uh, so that uh, people who are hearing impaired can, can at least comprehend what's going on. Um, and so we kind of came up with different ways to handle the, um, the captioning. Uh, in this case, it's sort of um, static, but in other places where you're looking around and you're going on a tour of the studio, the captioning will follow you as, as the narrator is explaining to you what's going on. Um, 
And you'll see that this isn't, you know, this isn't, uh, you know, Lucas Labs. This isn't high-end production values. This isn't Hollywood. This is just some very basic stuff that we did. And people, it was just an opportunity to show them, you know, something different. I want to point out, too, that we developed everything for the phone. So this was us sort of using this in the Unity uh, viewer. And so the point of view changes a lot when you go from this to like looking at it on a computer screen. It, it lengthens the point of view dramatically. And so we had to, you know, so while this is showing you what the experience is, um, it, it's a lot more real <laughs> when you're looking at it in the uh, thing. And then this is just, uh, just to show that the students oh, really got into it. The battle for humanity is not lost or lose. This nation has placed its destiny in the hands and the heads and the hearts of its millions of free men and women. We have the power to shape the civilization that we want. You owe it to others, as well as to yourself, to be very careful about letting others make up your mind for you. You have to learn how to see for yourself, hear for yourself, think for yourself, and then judge for yourself. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of information. <laughs> so anyway, it was just amazing how they took this one little piece of content and they turned it into this classroom exercise. So the next project that we're working on is coming up in this summer and we're going into a whole new different world with HoloLens. And so uh, we did this work on the VR and some folks in Redmond, Washington saw about what we were doing. They were jealous that we were using Oculus and so they said, can you, can you do something with the HoloLens? And I'm sitting here like, Sure, we can do something. And it's like my first thing was, can you spare a couple? Because they're like $3,000 a piece. Uh, and so um, we started talking with the folks at the Academy of Art. And this, is, and this is actually something that I wanted to do for a while. So when you come to our museum, we have these sort of tours during the museum where you can actually get a tour by a dozen that explains to you what's going on, what you're seeing in the paintings. But I wanted to do something where you could have a virtual docent, and the virtual docent could go beyond what the, the docent does in real life, in that we could tell that story that the docent sells, tells, but then also pull, draw from the collection to get content to show information about how like the painting was made, or an image was made, and why it was made. Uh, you, can, you can get uh, oral histories and stuff like that. So we decided to start playing around with this experience, and it's really only entitled Virtual Museum Guide. So if anyone has a great idea for a name, please let me know. Well, it's free, but you know I'll give you some royalties on a free <laughs> product. But anyway, so uh, we started looking at it. Um, the how, so if you if you go out and try to buy a Hololens right now, you can't uh, because Microsoft stopped selling the old Hololens one. You have to buy the Hololens two, which is not out yet. Um, it's currently in developer release and. We were able to secure a couple for the academy, just because they're right next door in Silicon Valley. Um, but one of the things that I'm particularly concerned about, the biggest challenge on this, is that there are production line setbacks, uh, and they're not seeing these coming out in in commercial uh, in a commercial way until like April. So we have some fallbacks on what we're going to do. But then the other thing is, it's three thousand dollars per unit to 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 have one, and while we might be able to get these for the museum, it, I have ideas of how I'd like to use this going forward, and it's not gonna be practical for a public school to get a $3,000 Halloween, so we're still trying to figure out what's the best way of what we wanna do. The other thing that we started looking at is that when you look at uh, stuff through a hollow lens, it projects, a, it projects light. So anything that's dark isn't projected. So when you're looking at something that has a lot of dark elements, it, effectively transparent. Uh, and so uh, you'll see something that's really beautiful and partially lit up and then the stuff that's black, you're seeing the stuff behind it uh, in the real world. Uh, and so that's at least what happens on a HoloLens 1. So we're hoping that the HoloLens 2 will be a little bit better. Um, the other thing was uh, we wanted to have an avatar that's going to have the widest uh, sort of accessibility to users. Uh, one initial thing was to um, have an avatar that's basically Norman Rockwell, and he could tell you about the Norman Rockwell content. Um, and that was my really lame effort of creating Norman Rockwell using the Xbox avatar editor, but 
Um, it's not bad. It's just that he doesn't really look up there. Um, but then the other thing is that uh, what I want to do with this experience is I want this to scale. So the VR experience for the four freedoms is great, but it's finite effectively to the four freedoms content. And it doesn't grow. Uh, unlike our audio tour, which every time we do an exhibition, I can put new content out like that. So I wanted to have something that would grow. And so um, thinking about, uh, you know, this is going to be opening next summer for a fantasy art exhibit at the museum. Norman Rockwell's not really the best spokesperson for fantasy art, so what do we do? Uh, and so um, in that particular case, rather than having a human being, we're going to actually have a dragon act as an avatar to walk you through the fantasy art exhibition. Um, but then it's also looking at how we can handle the audio narrative with the avatar gestures. I didn't want the students to be getting caught up in like lip syncing their, the, the character to the audio. Uh, and so what can we do to make it kind of work, but not be like, I don't want to spend 80% of our time for 20% of the, the experience. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, how do we balance, how will we balance the avatar content with the digital collection content. Uh, is it too many stimuli going on at one time? Uh, how do we handle object interactions? So the way that the, the HoloLens works is, is that instead of having a controller, you use your hands, and your hands are used to swipe things and make things bigger and all that stuff. And so uh, what are those interactions going to be? And then if we go down to the last bullet point, if you're in a gallery with other people who aren't wearing the HoloLens, what is someone doing this next to someone who's like looking at the art? How is that going to work? So we look at those things to try to figure out what's going to work best. Um, the opportunities is that we can see the artwork firsthand, and you get to see digital content too. Um, but the other big thing that we wanted to do uh, is make this a multiple user experience. So this is a one-on-one -on -one experience. We wanted something where someone could go in and actually go in with someone else wearing HoloLens and they could both share the same experience uh, and see that content. So it could be a family, it could be a group of people. Um, and how do, what are some logistics of handling that? Does everyone have the ability to manipulate the content or is there gonna be a leader? So these are questions that we're working through. Um, and then the other thing is, is that uh, when we were starting to work on this, the students were like, well, can you give us the layout of the galleries and stuff like that? And I'm sitting here like, no, I don't want to do that. I want you to abstract that out. I want you to be able to just sort of use the technology of the HoloLens to map out the, um, the room and then identify the images, sort of like you do with augmented reality, and then trigger the content and figure out where the, where the avatar is going to have to stand and where the content is going to have to go. Uh, and the reason for that is because if we use this in traveling exhibitions, it's going to change. If we use this in a classroom, it's going to change. If it's going to be an lecture hall, it's going to change. Um, so that's that's basically uh, the gist of our opportunities. Things that I wanted to talk about just quickly is that um, we are developing a fallback option so that it's more of an augmented uh, reality experience. So you'll just use your phone if we can't secure enough uh, HoloLens devices, or if we want to offer it in tandem with the HoloLens, people go out with their phones. The reason why I'm not a big fan of the phones is because now people are looking at their phones rather than looking at the art on the wall. And so the HoloLens gave us that little that balance. Um, the other thing is that we could fall back on the Magic Leap, which is another set of, of lenses, of glasses. The reason why we went, and they're both about the same price. This is about $22 to $2,600, and the HoloLens is $3,000. The reason why we went for the HoloLens is because what we learned with um, people coming to the museum is that if they're wearing glasses, <coughs> they want to wear their glasses while they're wearing the, the headset. And so uh, you can do that with these, but with uh, Magic Leap, you can't. You actually have to get a prescription insert to put in there. And if we were going to get a, we can't get a prescription insert for every person coming into the museum. And that would just mean that uh, some people wouldn't get to enjoy it. So the HoloLens was the way to go. Um, just an example, I mean, I, so just to give you an ex example of like, so this is now moving into a much newer terrain for museums, especially in, in the Norman Rockwell Museum and the stuff that we're doing. And I had to explain to them what spatial mapping was and what all this stuff was. And they were just like, 
you can do that and that you know like they were just freaked out by it but uh, but I had to sort of, sort of explain to them what spatial mapping was um, how you could use like a phone and do augmented reality to pick up stuff and identify things and then just how you can do image recognition and what what it does so I had to kind of convey that the technology was there to make that all happen and this was a very basic video that I created for the purposes of getting people excited. Um, and this is not an example of what the end product will look like, but this was just something that I wanted to show so that people could get excited. And, and um, when we showed this to Microsoft, they were really excited. And so uh, just to give you an example of how excited they were, um, the students in Microsoft at, at the Academy of Art are about a couple few blocks down the street from the Microsoft reactor in San Francisco. And so they got invited to go down to the reactor. Uh, Microsoft actually sent out a bunch of PR people from New York to go visit them to look at this. So this is like, this is actually really exciting stuff. At least for me it is. So I, um, we'll see how it turns out. But um, what I will say is that, I'll, I'll show you this and you can sort of get a sense of what we were trying to do. It's only a minute long. There's no sound because I, I was really lazy. So assume that the avatar is giving you a, a narration during this time. Well, what's really cool is that you can share the experience and now we can actually start to pull these oral histories. And the way this would work is that they would hear this. The regular people in the gallery wouldn't hear this, but they would see this and they'd be able to interact. And um, white socks. And Dad went to Island Grove on a Sunday morning. And there was a little bit of snow on the ground. Walked down to the town hall, which wasn't there. So that's just a very quick example of what we're trying to do. But that's what's going to be coming out for um, the summer, um, next summer, and um, we'll do it both for Rockwell content, fantasy art content. Um, there'll be multiple different, multiple interactions, so not just images and video, but there'll be three dimensional objects. We'll have, you know, the big thing is that a lot of people ask when they come to the museum, they see all the Saturday evening post covers, what's in the magazine, so now they'll be able to actually open up and start looking at them. Uh, and stuff like that. It's not it's not earth shaking, but it's uh, something that we think people would like. And uh, that's that's it. That's what I got. Thank you. Yeah, then it's one thirty. But are there any questions? A couple. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's interesting. Um, what I will say is that it's, I think that remains to be seen. I think that as the technology gets better, um, I think VR itself will probably kind of go its own way uh, and, and be replaced with more of mixed reality. Um, I think it's, it's definitely a way to lure people into museums, but it's not the end all be all for them to be there. Um, we're not the only museum in Berkshire County that does uh, VR. Uh, Mass Mocha does it as well. They actually use, um, I think they're actually using a Vive uh, with Laurie Anderson. Uh, and if you go to the museum uh, there, people have to sign up almost like a month in advance to like try it out. And, and so one of the things that I'm looking at is like, how can we do that so that people don't have to sign up, that they can just come and use it. And, and so we're not creating, I mean, the stuff that they're doing over at Mass Mocha is pretty, you know, cutting edge and, and it's very real. Um, and it's very different, and it's 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 epitome of like melding the art, a new art form. Um, for us, using it more as an educational tool, we're scaling back and just trying to make it so that it's a quick dive in. You can look around, you can play with it for a little bit. If you want to, you know, 
do more if you can. If not, you can take it off. One thing I will point out is that I'm finding that the use of VR in the museum setting may actually be finite, but the tool, the use of it in other places, especially like classrooms, is where I'm finding it to be more popular. And so uh, in the case of our VR experience, um, six hours worth of content is a lot of content. And so when you put that into a three-dimensional environment, into an app, that becomes a really large app to put on your phone. And so if you were to like buy it, get that off of Apple or, or uh, on iTunes, it would take a long time to download that content. I mean, uh, like right now, Star Wars Lucas Labs has got this thing called Vader Immortal, and you can download it. It's like two gigs, which is already kind of big for a, a VR experience. We're capping out at like six gigs with all the content that's in there. And so we had to actually, you know, to make it something as a tool for schools, um, we actually had, to, we're turning it into an app and we're ripping out all the content. We're putting it on the cloud with content delivery networks. And so that when you use it, you'll have to use a Wi-Fi and all the content will get served up via Wi-Fi. Um, but to answer your question, I think it, it's, it has a way to lure people. I think it's a neat thing that gets people kind of excited about something, but it's not the end all be all. Um, when you can connect, it can be really rewarding. Um, in, in our particular experience, uh, when you go into the bedroom where the kids are sleeping, uh, you can go and look over at the table and you'll see some M&Ms there and you can look at the M&Ms and dis discover that in 1943, M&Ms were invented for the soldiers and blah, blah, blah. And you know, what I, why I bring that up is that those kids that, try, that saw that in our museum, in the VR experience, an hour later are like running through the museum in the Four Freedoms Gallery going, oh my God, that's the m and painting, you know, so they're starting to create a connection. It's not a profound connection, but at least it's a connection to know that there, that there was a whole world before them and, and that there's context in that. So. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, each um, sort of phase of the presentation, there's just so much to think about in terms of the educational technology and sort of expanding our idea of, of even like what an art museum is. Mm -hmm. And so even I'm just kind of looking at, at this image right here and how virtual reality and all this other kind of technology is, you know, is used in the museum, but as you're saying, perhaps outside of the museum, mm -hmm. that so much of the Norman Rockwell Museum going forward could perhaps be experienced beyond the brick and mortar space of the Norman Rockwell Museum. So just, I mean, in these conversations that you're having um, with other colleagues, I mean, how are you imagining the importance of the material presence of the work of art and making a compelling case to come to the museum with what sounds like, I mean, going forward, mm -hmm. could be the experience of this museum remotely. Right. Yeah. So the way I'll answer that is that um, the technology provides us with an opportunity to, to view the artwork in ways that you couldn't normally do. Like, you know, like, and so, but it also develops this desire to see it. Um, and what I'll say about that is that um, in the one that we're working on for this summer, um, we, we've got scans of the artwork that's super high res to the point that you can like zoom up and see the brush strokes. And if you were to try to do that in a museum, you know, there would be a little sensor there saying you're getting too close. Um, and, and what I'm finding is that that kind, of, that kind of content and that type of interaction and then being able to see the context and seeing stuff in a deeper way has been the true motivator for people to come to the museum or to see the work in general. Like So if they're not coming to our museum or not going to another exhibition, they're actually looking up Norman Rockwell. I mean, the uh, we don't have those connector points yet, but you know it'll be soon where we can, where if someone you know swipes out of this and goes into a browser to look up Norman Rockwell, then they're looking at that stuff online. I mean, in most cases, if it's anything deep about Norman Rockwell, they're going to be seeing something from a Norman Rockwell museum. And so uh, it's, it's um, I'll say it that way. The other thing I'll say is that um, I think that the future of museums is going to change a lot, especially as technology changes. Um, you know, in one of the things that we're already seeing right now is the competition for like the entertainment dollar. Uh, and so, you know, in Berkshire County, we're, we're one of like many cultural institutions. And 
if we were competing with Boston, we couldn't compete because you got everything here in Boston. So you're you're competing with all these this entertainment dollar in in the museum sector and the in the cultural sector, but then you're also competing with the Netflixes of the world and now the Apple Plus and the Disney Plus and all these different things that people are vying for. And so I think that um, museums are going to have to sort of change some of their business plans to to kind of accommodate for that. And, and you, we're already seeing that. So like uh, the Van Gogh Museum out of the Netherlands, um, they have already created these sort of um, exhibitions where there's actually no real artwork. Uh, it's actually all replicas, digital reproductions. They're all immersive experiences. If you go to the Springfield Museum in Springfield, Mass, <coughs> you can go see this Van Gogh exhibit where you can actually walk into his bedroom or sit at the cafe and they're doing all these things. And so. What's cool about that is that people, one, you know, people in Springfield, Massachusetts aren't gonna probably have much opportunity to see a Van Gogh in person, uh, but it also inspires them to then start looking at Van Gogh in other ways. And so I'm just sort of seeing like that's, I'm already starting to see that kind of writing on the wall where um, museums have to find a way to engage and, and get people and, and use these as the lure to get them to, to come in to see the paintings on the wall. You touched on this briefly, but I'm curious about the um, kind of getting across the part of the scenes within the museum to think about the in gallery experience mm -hmm. and and how VR in particular um, changes the experience. Yeah. How do you get everyone on the same page to kind of try it, right. do it, sure. conservation as an example, right. traditional interpretation. So with the with this, um, it was a big lift to get everyone to get on board about doing VR. Um, so the, pen, the potential of, of doing VR, one thing it also it did is it opened up this whole can of worms about how we were, how we were archiving and digitizing content. Because you know we started digitizing in 2003 and we, we were using archival standards from back then. And all of a sudden, you know, I was finding that some of the stuff that we wanted to do wasn't cut. It's not just scanning. It's not just scanning. And, and, and so they, it was just more of like they had to start thinking about, OK, we need to, if we want to use it in this way, this is how we're going to need that, that content for this metadata. I mean, the, the, the people who are working in the Durham Department and Archives, they're doing a great job of, of and they're like metadata freaks. And they're, they're getting all the stuff and capturing it, but they don't really have a sense of what that world is beyond. Yeah, yeah, and so. Um, I think the biggest eye-opener was that when we upgraded our collection management system so that we had this API that could connect what to them. We're using EMU. So there, there's a number of collection management systems, but there are two big ones. There's EMU and, and TMS. Yeah, yeah. Um, TMS is really expensive. And it's like, I feel like, you know, like you spend a ton of money for the system and then, oh, you want to put it on the web? Double that price. Right. And we're just simply, we can't, do, we can't do that. So we went with EMU, which is a, a system that is used predominantly by like natural history museums, more object related than paintings and, 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 and prints and stuff like that, and magazines. Um, but it has this robust API uh, where you can, you can call up things you know, like every which way that you need to, to do it. Uh, and um, it was just like, you know, so, but, Going back to the VR experience, you know, like saying, like, I want to be able to give them the experience of opening up the magazine. It's like, you know, well, no one ever thought about scanning the whole magazine. They just scanned the Rockwell stuff. And so then we had to go through and scan magazines and do, you know, all that stuff. But then it was also attributing that content, which really has no Rockwell bearing on it, to the Rockwell thing, except that they knew, like, that's all tied together now. Uh, and so it, the work that we've been doing has sort of changed how people think. Um, so you're convincing them in small bites to try small things first, and then well, yeah, and, and we start with very simple things. Yeah, we and, and so like the audio tour is a classic example of that, where it's like, um, you know, now rather than just like producing an exhibition video, it's like, well, we're going to go down and talk to the artists, and we're going to start <coughs> talking about how they mean each thing, and we're going to think about these things, and then we're going to look at their their process materials, so the sketches, the reference photos, all that stuff, and we're going to find ways to now connect the dots with the other. So 
don't know if that really answers truly answers your question, but it's the big thing is, is that it has changed how people look at the world, and and I think the biggest movement I've seen is especially with like our chief curator and our director of uh, curatorial operations because. He now sees, like the chief curator sees it now. The yeah, and now she, sometimes I have to scale it back because she's, I mean, like we had one exhibit where we had like six or seven digital things going on, and I'm like, that, to me, that's like too much. Um, but like the curator, uh, the director of curatorial operations who's responsible for the, the collection is now seeing the value of that, te of the technology and those interactions. Um, Do they have, are there like numbers that are helping them see the value, or is it more they're just starting to understand? The well, concepts? one number. Well, I mean, like I, so I, I, Dash, didn't, I didn't, yeah. So like I can show everything. Um, so I spoke briefly about it with the one interactive, but it's like I can tell them uh, the percentage of utilization. I can tell them what they're looking at. I can tell them how long they're staying, how long they're staying, lingering, all that stuff. I can even with the audio tour, I can tell them the flow of how people are moving through the museum. Um, so there's all this data that, that, that now I can show. Um, the big thing is is that uh, like every year the interactions with the content has like grown uh, and, and we had the biggest growth last year with this full freedoms exhibition, especially because we are now in major cities. And so you know like we were averaging like 60,000 interactions a year with like just some, some things and then, uh, in just the museum alone, and then now we're at like, over 600,000 interactions, um, like user, yeah, bigger audience, bigger audience, yeah, exactly. So, but like that 30,000 number with the VR was like, I, I mean, I literally was like, you know, like, you know, there's just no way that I'm mean, like, I'm doing the math, and then I'm realizing, and then I did the math and figured out that you know, people, are, you know, if there are 10 people, if people are on it for five, 10 minutes. And there are four stations, and they're open eight hours a day. You know, I can do the math, and that comes out to thirty thousand people. So, all right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you.